I like to open the floor to, uh, to, to, to now for, for questions um, from the audience. We have uh, technically we have only five minutes, mm. but I think I like uh, to see whether there are comments or, or questions to for, for our speakers. So now the floor is open. So please uh, keep your question or comments very short, so we can actually. Uh, give a, a, a bit of time to everybody. So we have a. a um, I'm afraid my question might not be totally relevant. I wanted to ask, maybe it's more appropriate to ask when Julia was here. Uh, mm -hmm. Would the speaker, perhaps Dr. Uh, Palo, comment on the relative competitiveness or relatively uncompetitiveness when it gets to international education? When you develop in a financial center, you have to have the talents. And I, I think uh, Margaret mentioned that the English standard is getting not as good, but how would that compare to the other centers? Okay. I don't think there's another, another question here. So maybe we can bundle a few together, so, and then we can go back to the panel. So I have a quick question for the panelists. So because the uh, RMB depreciation expectation is building up currently, so I just want to know that will it have any impact to the rise of the financial center in Greater China, and will there will be any impact to the growth of the offshore uh, RMB center in Hong Kong? Because major majority of the participant is holding on to RMBs because with a view that the RMB will appreciate against the US dollar. Okay. Any more questions from the floor? Well, in that case, I will ask the panel to address these two questions. One is the uh, RMB, the other one is the rule of education, so as a competitive advantage for financial centers. I also have a question. I'd like to uh, pick what uh, James said, and China is uh, unpredictable, sorry, and, and surprise uh, uh, even uh, very careful China watchers. So I'd like to turn to particularly Gary and Juma um, to see whether you see some surprise from this. But actually, I will start with uh, um, um, uh, Seiwa, uh, Siwa to actually address some of the questions because I know you have to go. And, yeah. um, Sorry, I, uh, the, uh, I, I, <clears throat> okay, I just uh, talk about the, uh, the talent. I think uh, the, uh, the, uh, the strongest competitive advantage of Hong Kong is the talent. You know? So for, uh, for China or Hong Kong, uh, uh, Hong Kong or Singapore, if we were to, uh, uh, to develop financial center, I think talent is very important. You know, the London, when you look at the London, when you look at the uh, New York, you know, the reason is that it is it is very much a, a pr professional service, a professional cluster. So if Hong Kong was to really make Hong Kong great successful, it's not just the policy. It is really the accountant, CPA, investment banker, commercial banker, consulting firms. But Hong Kong is facing this uh, because it's so crowded. It's, uh, people are fed up, you know, with living in Hong Kong. I know there are some foreigners that live here. You know, it's no longer comfortable. So I think that is a. Uh, a big uh, crisis to consider. You know, Taiwan recently being severely criticized by the, uh, uh, the, 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 the vice premier of Singapore. Singapore say, you know, they want to open up, they want to attract talent. And the Singapore vice premier spe specifically say they want to make the Taiwan mistake, meaning that the Taiwan is so close to not welcoming talent. I think for Shanghai, you know, and other places, you know, really that links to the education and the ta uh, talent. The more, more open up, uh, the more bringing in from foreign talent, the more competitive the financial center will be. Thank you. Uh, Gary, do you think um, then China might surprise us and just uh, unveil reforms that nobody expects? Uh, or are these reforms actually yeah. already brewing? And, uh... mm -hmm. Yes, uh, there are lots of uh, things for China to reform ahead. Uh, sometimes China can uh, surprise the world by beyond its expectation, but uh, I'm afraid that uh, sometimes they probably in the next ten years they can also surprise the whole world in another way, uh, which means probably they cannot control uh, the whole situation. And uh, if they cannot control the whole situation, the economy will run into problem, maybe also social problem, the social unrest issue, and all these things will uh, bring big uncertainties to the financial. Uh, centers in China. Uh, and also I want to address the question about Zimin B 
uh, depreciation. I'm afraid that uh, uh, the reasoning de depreciation is not a short-term uh, uh, trend. Probably it's a long-term trend because the uh, uh, reasoning de depreciation in the past years was uh, primarily driven by the trade surplus of China. But uh, this trade surplus was based on the distorted uh, price of factors of production in China, like uh, the pollution cost, the labor cost, uh, and also uh, the financial cost, the capital cost. Uh, but if you know the situation in China, you will, uh, you, you will admit that all these costs uh, will have to uh, restore to a normal level, uh, which means the production cost in China will inevitably continue to rise in the next decade. And uh, as a result of this, and also because of the global rebalance of the global trade, uh, China cannot enjoy uh, its golden time of accumulating trade surplus and foreign exchange reserve. And because of this, uh, the ZMB, uh appreciation will stop, and uh, probably depreciate you know, will happen. Uh, so, of course, this will be a big factor for financial centers, because so far, ZMB is making progress in, global, in internationalization, uh, also because uh, the expectation of the uh, appreciation. If the ZMB continue to decrease, uh, and the market, uh, you know, expect this, and uh, many people they don't want to hold the ZMB for long term. So absolutely, this will be uh, a negative factor for the ZMB internationalization. Uh, yeah. This Do you agree? Um, I'm afraid I'm not. Um, <laughs> uh, let me say. Uh, Two things here. One is uh, on the reform front. I think uh, uh, the pace of reform may surprise on the upside, meaning that surprising market expectation. Uh, let's look at what happened last uh, month. We had an increase in QP quota by 50 billion US dollar, and for the last entire eight years, we had only 30 billion. Uh, so that's a massive uh, acceleration of uh, opening of the uh, capital markets, and we had a widening of the trading band for the RMB. And uh, we had a commitment from the government to raise the SOE dividend payout ratio. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we also had an announcement of the central bank, from the central bank setting up an independent cross-border payment system. Why do they need to do that? Because I think the government clearly understands in a few years' time, the capital account will be basically open. And therefore, FX transactions, especially cross-border uh, foreign uh, exchange transactions, will be massively increased. And therefore, we need an infrastructure which provides efficient, low-cost, um, and uh, safe um, <clears throat> uh, processing mechanisms. So all these are strong indications that the government is moving towards more opening uh, of the capital account. And with that, you have to, because you do understand the logic and sequencing, you have to do the other things like uh, uh, interest rate liberalization, and also increasing flexibility of the exchange rate. Uh, I do expect uh, uh, these three things at least, interest rate liberalization, capital account opening, or basic opening of capital account and uh, uh, much more flexibility of the exchange rate to be achieved within the next three to five years. Um, the second thing is on the exchange rate. Uh, I think uh, this uh, short-term depreciation pressure uh, should go away if the European situation stabilizes. Uh, every time we had this uh, depreciation expectation, it was because of a global shock. Right? Last time is 2008, when the Lehman crisis hit, and last year, September, the first round of uh, European shock, and now the second round uh, is coming back again. We have minus 0.8% uh, <clears throat> the expectation for, for annual depreciation for RMB. Uh, once these things <clears throat> goes away, I think we'll go back to a modest appreciation trend. Why do I say that? Because currently we still have a trade surplus. It's not zero. Um, <clears throat> in terms of current account surplus, I think this will be 2 point something percent of GDP. It will take another three to four years at the current pace to go down to zero. So at least within this period, three to four year time period, um, it's actually ideal uh, for China to open up capital account because we'll be enjoying a very small appreciation pressure. Um, appreciation pressure between 0% to, let's say, 2 to 3% annually is the best. It's ideal uh, for developing the offshore market because we'll be attracting some RMB <coughs> flows into Hong Kong. Uh, it's not massive, it's steady. And at the same time, if you open capital account, it will not allow will not induce too much of an inflow of capital, and therefore uh, the uh, impact on both the offshore and domestic market could be rather controllable. Thank you. Thank you. Professor, I have of um, centers. Uh, maybe I talk a little bit about you know, the depreciation expectation okay. of RMB. Right. 
Uh, I think that's actually one reason why a renminbi deposit base sort of plateaued off at you know 600 billion uh, in Hong Kong. I think that's one key reason. But I think the other key reasons for building up an international uh, an offshore uh, renminbi center is actually how we use those funds, uh, how we use the renminbi liquidity pool, both onshore and offshore. And offshore, we talk about offering more products and services uh, like the RQP funds, and in the future, maybe we have you know, more insurance policy, IPOs denominated in renminbi. We actually had one earlier when Cheung Kong, you know, one of their REITs uh, listed in Hong Kong in renminbi denomination. So we have already started that. Uh, and then offshore is how, uh, what kind of channels and avenues we have in terms of repatriating those offshore renminbi funds back into China. And right now we all know uh, they have approved foreign direct investments in renminbi, uh, so meaning companies could use the funds raised offshore to repatriate and flow back to China for investments in projects and companies. So I like that word, and you know, Dr. Ma used circulation really. You know, we have this pool of renminbi liquidity, and then how we use that pool, we, we need to have active, interactive circulation. Otherwise, we just have like a dead pool of water. So I think that's important. And longer term is really how the offshore markets interact with the onshore market in terms of fund flows, in terms of cooperation, in terms of product innovation, etc. Thank you. Um, James, maybe you can actually ask you this question about education and generally the uh, lifestyle, in, uh, the important lifestyle in uh, financial centers for attracting talent. Okay. Um, thank, thank you, Paula. Um, we are actually at the forefront of uh, educating finance professionals. We have 3,000 over members in Hong Kong alone, and and. Anthony is a very good example of our member. Um, so I'm very proud of that. Um, and in China, um, the Ministry of Finance is uh, very focused on building up this finance talent pool. And they have given a directive to the CICPA um, to produce as many qualified accountants as possible um, but CICPA, in their own wisdom, has gone the other way, um, good and bad. Um, the passing rate for their exams are actually quite low, um, about 8 to 15 percent passing rate. Uh, compared to ours, globally, it's more like 80 percent. Obviously, when Anthony and I were taking it, it's more like 25 percent. Um, so we are hoping that it's a reflection of attracting top talent into the profession rather than saying that our exams has become easier. <laughs> um, so important thing is uh, CSCPA and the um, Ministry of Finance recognize that they haven't got, they have an acute shortage of uh, qualified finance professionals, not just for the domestic economy and the domestic inter uh, financial center, but they realized that um, the, the, the local talent will also have to be experienced and trained and be well-versed um, in international way of doing things. And this is very important because it has an impact on investor confidence indirectly because you have heard about uh, the cross-border audit quality of uh, Chinese companies having gone to the U.S. Uh, and reverse take over some of the companies. And I do commend Hong Kong for banning it. So Hong Kong never need to send inspection team to Shanghai. And now the SEC is trying to do that. Uh, I just like to make a little comment because it is very important because throughout the whole world, um, the media is picking on China, saying that the Chinese authorities are not allowing the SEC to go and inspect uh, the auditors in China, but nobody talked about what the Chinese authority is thinking. Chinese authority is saying that we don't want to talk to you about one isolated case. Yes, we want to resolve it, but we would like to, to agree on, on a framework whereby it covers all eventual, eventualities, 
and all scenarios to the day where a U.S. company will come to China and raise capital. Will they allow the Chinese authority to then go and subpoena the U.S. auditor? So that's what the Chinese authorities' view is. And we as an, as, as an institute, we do look at the future and, and we do support that. So back to this uh, talent thing, um, Hong Kong has sent a lot of finance professionals over to China to work. Uh, example, when I was trying to bring my membership numbers up in mainland China, I discovered that in the big four alone, official list in London shows about 26 members in each of the big four. But when I talked to the senior partners, they said I can count on my fingers, there are more than 40. So where are the missing in action? It means that a lot of Hong Kong, of our members, their mailing address is in Hong Kong. But when they move to China, their mailing address remains in Hong Kong. So a lot of uh, international finance professionals have moved into China. And not only Shanghai, but in other domestic uh, financial centers like Ningpo and uh, Chongqing and uh, Guangzhou, as well as Beijing. So they are building up and the Chinese authorities are actually willing to send their talent overseas. But the key is really attracting top talent into the financial profession. That is how you sustain uh, the growth of the financial center. Not just looking at the growth, but like I was saying, you need people who also is a wet blanket like me who have to ask questions like, you know, are we ready to face the risk? Because if they don't manage the risk, the, there is a big danger that they get complacent and that the, the growth of the financial center may just stumble. Thank you, James. Um, I'm afraid we need to stop here. It's been a very interesting panel, lots of food for thought. Uh, it would be good to have another couple of hours to discuss all these uh, issues, but I'm afraid the master ceremony will be very, very upset with me if I don't stop here. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Fatu and all, and all the panelists. Here comes the end of our event. Uh, thank you very much for your participations and contributions. See you again at other Bohemia events. Thank you. Bye-bye.